difference between coal and diamonds, between sand and computers, between good health and bad health, is how the atoms are arranged. Today's manufacturing technologies really can't arrange atoms with any degree of control. It's sort of like nature has given us a bunch of Lego blocks and we got boxing gloves on our hands. Nanotechnology is going to let us take off the boxing gloves and arrange the fundamental building blocks of matter, the very atoms and molecules, in most of the ways permitted by physical law. My name is Ralph Merkel. I'm a principal fellow at Zyvex. I do research in nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is about very, very small molecular machines. We can't build them yet, but we will in the coming decades. A nanometer is a very, very, very small distance. If my arm is a meter in length, then a thousand times smaller than that is a millimeter, which is something you can see, but it's small. And a thousand times smaller than a millimeter is a micron. And you could barely see a micron under a very powerful optical microscope. And a thousand times smaller than a micron is a nanometer, which is a billionth of a meter. And a nanometer is about the size of an atom. So it's down on the scale of the atoms and the molecules that we can build these molecular machines. So we're looking at a theoretical device. This hasn't been built. As you can see, it has individual atoms. Each of those little circles is an individual atom. And as a consequence, this device is pretty small in size. It doesn't have a lot of range of motion on the order of a few angstroms. But within that range of motion, it can move and fiddle and control something and position it with six degrees of freedom. It's, it's X, Y, and Z, roll, pitch, and yaw. Now, if you ask, could this be synthesized using existing organic chemistry, the answer is, I don't think so. This structure, and indeed a lot of these very stiff, complex molecular structures, look like they're well beyond existing synthetic capabilities. So we have to develop a new set of capabilities in order to make them. Now, chemists have been arranging atoms for centuries. What we want to do is to bring to the manufacturing process the precision that a chemist brings in the synthesis of a molecule. When people talk about nanotechnology, they think about building very, very tiny things. But in fact, we want to build things at all sizes. We want to build big things. Well, how do you build a big thing out of molecular parts? We're starting with parts that are about a nanometer in size. Suppose I take those nanometer parts and I build two nanometer parts, twice as big. Then I take those two nanometer parts and I build four nanometer parts. Those are twice as big. And then I take those four nanometer parts and I build eight nanometer parts. Those are twice as big. At every level, the parts are very precise. If you look at them, they're molecular in the precision, but they're getting bigger and bigger. That's called convergent assembly. When we're talking about what future technology will look like, it's always a bit uncertain. But one image that seems to make sense is that nanotechnology, molecular manufacturing, will be a kitchen appliance. It will be a box that you put in your kitchen. And when you want to build something, there's a, a menu, there's perhaps a control panel on the front. And you say, I want item number 47. 
and item number 47 is a toaster. So you press the control buttons, you pour in the equivalent of toner, molecular feedstock, so these devices can have something to work with, and this box goes to work and you come back an hour or two later and there's your toaster. Or a chair. Or another box. We're looking at a transformation that's going to have as big an impact as the Industrial Revolution, if not more. We'll be able to build products. All the products that we see in the world around us with molecular precision, with lower cost, greater strength, less pollution. It's a revolution in manufacturing and we see it coming in a few decades. We're going to see technology transform our lives in ways that we can scarcely understand right now. But in ways, I think, that will improve the human condition, that will benefit all of us. Mostly, I remember there were sort of two eras when I was a child. There was before my father died, when I just did what seemed natural. And then my father died when I was 14, and of course that was a very traumatic event. And I thought about you know, what is life and what is existence, and gradually I decided, well, existence in life is about people. We do research in technology, we advance technology, because it will benefit people not because of some abstract ideal about truth. What we're doing now, what Zyvex is doing, is we're, well, let's, let's draw back from the grand visions for a moment. We aren't there yet. But this kind of work is part of the top-down approach towards nanotechnology. The idea is we can build fairly large things, things that are on the scale of microns, and we can then move down to ever smaller scales using that as a starting point. Then there's the bottom-up approach. That's the approach of taking the atoms and molecules and building larger and larger complex structures using scanning probe microscopes. This is the state of the art today. This is a scanning probe microscope. And the basic idea is very simple. You take a sharp probe, that's where the probe part comes in the scanning probe microscope, and that sharp pointy probe pokes at a surface and you scan the probe over the surface. And if the probe is really sharp, then the atom, uh, the tip of the probe, can then image the surface and you can actually see the individual atoms. We can image things like buckyballs on a silicon surface. And a buckyball, by molecular standards, is a fairly big molecule. It has 60 atoms in it. We're just able, at this point, to move those buckyballs on the surface. And we can image those buckyballs on the surface and see where they are and what's going on. We expect that this kind of equipment will gradually become more capable in terms of its ability to manipulate molecules and atoms on surfaces and to arrange those atoms and molecules into more complex structures. We're just starting out. It's always easier to look at what is possible, theoretically, than to realize it in practice. Flight to the moon. Well, if you look back at the history of rocketry, you find one of the major problems is that many people thought it couldn't be done. There was a very famous editorial in the 1920s, New York Times Magazine. It's impossible to go to the moon because there's no air to push against in space. Rockets won't work. Well, 
we can laugh today. But that was a serious concern back then. That was a serious misunderstanding. And we have equally serious misunderstandings about nanotechnology today. And at some point, sometime there will be an effort to build molecular manufacturing systems. We don't have a major program, a national level program, a multi-billion dollar program to develop molecular manufacturing. But we will at some point. My dad taught physics back at Berkeley, and in the 50s, he went to the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, as it was known back then, and he ran Project Pluto. Now, you'll have to remember back in the 50s, we were still working out how it was you deliver nuclear weapons. People were still thinking, well, maybe what we should have is a nuclear-powered airplane that would simply fly around continuously. So one of the ideas was a nuclear-powered ramjet and my father ran the project to develop the nuclear reactor for the nuclear-powered ramjet for the nuclear-powered airplane. Once the nuclear reactor had been developed, however, Congress decided to cancel a program, and I think for rather obvious reasons, having an airplane with a nuclear reactor on board didn't look like the best Thing to be testing in the area and the project was quietly shelved. If you look at it and say should we have developed that nuclear capability, that nuclear ramjet, I think in retrospect we can say well the idea of an airplane flying around with nuclear power on board doesn't look like a sensible one we did make the correct decision. We did decide not to deploy that particular technology. But as we look at new technologies, we don't know exactly what they are. Right now, there's still a debate about whether molecular machines are possible or not. We cannot regulate a technology. We cannot decide on whether to deploy a technology or not to deploy a technology if we don't understand what it is. There's an idea floating around that perhaps technologies are so unthinkable we should back away from the basic research, we should back away from understanding the technologies. I think that's a mistake. We need to understand what technology can do. We need to understand that both so we can make intelligent decisions, but also so that we can understand what other people, what others might do to us. New technologies have always brought new capabilities, new benefits, and new potential for harm. Take fire. We learn to benefit from that technology. We can cook our food. And we learn to deal with the problems that that technology could create. We have fire departments. This new technology could pose new problems. We need to understand those. We need to respond to those. We need to develop the equivalent of the fire department. We need to think about how do we deal with those problems? How do we deal with the issues? If we have a box that makes things, what should it make? We might decide there are things we don't want to manufacture. Weapons, for example, maybe you don't want to be able to push item number 437 and have some very nasty little weapon come out. Maybe that, that should be restricted. At the end of the day, we are all responsible for making the decisions that affect our future. And we collectively have to make the decisions about how to deal with new technologies. Believe me, 
Believe me, no one wants to go back to the caves. No one is going to say, I'm going to renounce modern technology. Anyone with any sense is going to say, no, I don't want to give away all of these benefits and go back to the cave. So we're not going to walk away from technology. But we do need to understand what technology can do, how to benefit from it, and how to control the risks. I don't think there was any one thing in my life that made me suddenly realize this is where you need to go, this is what you need to do. It was more a, an accretion of small things, a gradual and a growing realization that life is good, life is pleasant, life is fun. And it goes on for a while, and then life is short. Life is something we don't get enough of. We can have longer lives, we can have better lives, we can have lives that are richer and fuller, and we can do that if we think about it and if we prepare and if we plan. It's pretty obvious at this point that medical technology is improving and that our lifespans are getting longer, and more to the point, that our healthy lifespan is getting longer. It doesn't do any good to live to a hundred, a hundred and twenty years old if you're wretched and miserable and unhealthy. But if you're a hundred, twenty years chronologically, but you feel like you're thirty or forty, that's pretty good. And we're moving in that direction. Now, pretty obviously, as technology advances, as nanotechnology advances, Medicine will get new tools, new capabilities, and new ways to keep people alive and healthy. Well, imagine going to the doctor in the future, and you say, Doctor, I, I feel these funny things, and he diagnoses you, well, you know, it's, you have cancer, you know, and you say, oh, well, what do we do about that? And he says, well, we're going to inject you with these small medical devices. These small devices float around your body. They're smaller than a human cell. They can distinguish between a cancer cell and a normal cell. And if they're in a cancer cell, selectively remove that cancer cell. So what is today a horrible killer, a fearsome disease, in the future will be a visit to the doctor's office, an injection, and oh yeah, come back and see me next week to make sure it works. And there's a question. Will you and I be there to enjoy this marvelous expansion of medicine and lifespan? The answer is maybe. So this bracelet is an Alcor bracelet. And basically, if something unfortunate should happen to me, if I should find myself in the hospital or otherwise in an unhealthy state, this bracelet has instructions. Call up Alcor in Scottsdale, Arizona. Let them know that I'm in a hospital or wherever I am and that they should come out and be prepared, if necessary, to cryonically suspend me. Basically, you're cooled temperature of liquid nitrogen where nothing happens. No chemical changes, no changes to the tissues, and once you're cooled to that temperature, you can stay at that temperature for years, decades, centuries, essentially unchanged. Until we develop this remarkable medical technology that can not only keep us alive and healthy, but will also be able to reverse 
the kind of damage that occurs in a cryonic suspension. For those of us who think the future is going to be a pretty good place, it looks like a good idea. Well, think about the alternatives. Either you sign up or you don't, and either it works or it doesn't. Now, that creates a payoff matrix with four possibilities. If it doesn't work, or if you don't sign up, well, we know what the outcome is in that case. But if you sign up, and it works, you'll wake up in a future which cares about human beings, cares about human life, has remarkable technology, will find out, oh yeah, that worked out the way we thought. Oh, that other thing, no, it worked out very differently than the way we thought. We'll be able to see what happens. Of course we're moving towards a better world. That's the whole point of all of this. Technology can benefit people, and we have to make sure that technology does benefit people. Every Sunday, explore uncharted territories, uncover high-profile secrets, and unearth the unknown with Tech TV's critically acclaimed series, Secret Strange and True. Never before have so many people had power in...